Good morning, Orchard Hill Church. I am Mike Chilcote. My nine to five, I'm the uh, young, I work for Young Life. I'm the regional director for what's called the Keystone Region. That's most of PA and a little bit of Ohio. But my wife and I and our three daughters uh, call Orchard Hill home. And we actually live in the area. And uh, it's not lost on us because we are members here at Orchard Hill that we get a chance to get up here and teach. Uh, So I'm humbled to get to do it, humbled to get to spend a little time with you this morning and dive in, and hopefully the hope here and the prayer is that we leave here knowing Christ more than when we walked in. So that's the hope. It's also fun to see my buddy Dan Irvin on that video. He's eating Peppies. If you've never gone to Peppies, make sure you get the Roethlisberger. It's fantastic. I don't know what he ordered there. He made a mistake, and I'll have to tell him that next time I'm with him. Um, So we are continuing on in the series called Happier, and uh, last week you heard from Russ in 1 Corinthians 7. We're continuing on in 1 Corinthians 8. This morning, and you could title this message this morning, this sermon, Free to Sacrificially Love. To have the freedom, the freedom to actually love sacrificially. It sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. To to possess this freedom that helps us to, to bypass that freedom and to lay it down in the pursuit of sacrificially loving other people. So free to sacrificially love. And as Russ talked about, and as uh, I'm gonna talk about today, uh, right during this time when this letter was written by Paul, there, was many, there were many problems arising in Corinth, many problems arising in the church of the Corinthians. Uh, the main issues revolved around disunity and sexual immorality. Uh, but we're gonna dive into some ones that were maybe uh, off on the side a little bit that they brought up in the letter as well. And, you know, I thought about this morning, I thought about wearing a Penn's jersey, I thought about wearing a Crosby jersey, but, you know, I thought I'd go with the suit, And you might be wondering, why does Chili look like he's about to sell us a Chrysler? It's because I uh, have a wedding directly following this. Literally, I will say amen, and then, you know, like Elvis or someone, I'll duck out the back, and my car is even facing the right direction. The good news is, if you're thinking, oh, no, Chili's going to be late for the wedding, the good news is it's right down the street in Maryland. So the uh, the wedding is in Maryland. Uh, This was a terrible plan on my behalf, but... Uh, and a good thing, it's, it's a really old friend of mine, a uh, 46-year-old guy who's never been married, so we're all really excited to be a part of it. I'm guessing I won't make it. I'm guessing I will be there for the reception, but Kimmy and I have had so many moments where we've stuck into the back of a wedding. Maybe you're better people than we are, but we have had to do that. Uh, one of my favorites was there was a moment when Kimmy and I are driving to a really a rural, kind of a barn wedding. We get lost. We're definitely going to be late. We pull up thinking, oh, we'll sneak into the back of the barn and no one will notice, and the wedding is outside. Has this ever happened to you? Where we're kind of driving by the tree line, trying not to be seen, and then getting to the back of the wedding, because they were dismissing by rows, we're like, we gotta get in there. We were, we looked like a scene out of Band of Brothers where Kimmy and I were running from like hay bale to hay bale to hide, and then we finally got there. We went in, we did the old thing where you sit, and then everybody gets up and claps. We're like, beautiful, beautiful service, right? We saw about four seconds of it, but that's what's gonna happen soon. If you can picture me in Maryland in just a few hours, that'll be what's going down. So back to the passage here in 1 Corinthians 8, you have the church in Corinth is dealing with these issues. And around the time that this was written, this would have been uh, during Paul's third missionary journey. But prior to that, Paul had actually spent 18 months with the Corinthians. They were his buddies, he knew them well. And it was this this new church, and with it came a lot of problems and a lot of misunderstanding. But here's Paul on his third missionary journey, and they send a correspondence to him. They send a letter. He receives a letter from the church in Corinth, and there's several disputes and various issues have come up within the church, and they're asking Paul if he'll address them. So here's Paul navigating these questions by the Corinthians uh, and about their traditional way of life, and here's where it gets a little nuanced. Paul is having to navigate this with the church in Corinth through the lens of idol worship and idol sacrifice in the ancient world. That culturally, there was a lot of this going on, and he's trying to navigate it where he's trying to give them instructions, but also be cognizant of the fact that this was really common, the idol worship in the ancient world and how that went down culturally, and he's trying to figure out how can we navigate this in love. Back uh, in the day when they would make a sacrifice uh, to an idol, 
This would be a sacrifice to, in an attempt to feed the gods. They would sacrifice an animal in an attempt to feed the gods. One third of the animal that you brought into sacrifice would be burned. One third of the animal would go to the temple priests. And then there's this sticky situation, the sticky subject of what do you do with the other third, the last one third of the animal. And so the last one third of the animal you would take home and you would feed your family with it or you'd throw a barbecue in your neighborhood and watch the Pens game or something. Or you'd, this is what you would do with this last third of the meat, you would take it home. So the one third that you take home feeds your family. Well, there's some sticky situations arising because what if your non-Christian friend invites you over for dinner? Some of these folks that are following Christ at the Church of Corinth were like, what if I get invited to a barbecue and I know that this animal was sacrificed to an idol, can I eat this? Can I, can I go and grab some of this pulled pork or am I not allowed to because it was sacrificed uh, to an idol? It's an interesting question, right? And they're, they're asking them things like, will God be unhappy if I eat this meat? Will he be frustrated with me? Uh, should they never eat with non-believers? I don't assume to know who's in this room. There's probably a lot of folks that have been in a relationship with Jesus Christ for a long time and have been attempting to follow Christ. There's probably others that are just getting a feel for it in here or others that are like, I have no idea where I stand. I'm just here checking it out. I heard it was food sacrificed to idols. I thought, man, I gotta see that one. No, but I, you probably are here and maybe feeling it out and checking it out. But the question here for the believers that Paul is posing is, should they never eat with non-Christians? That doesn't seem right. Because the meat was sacrificed to these idols? Is that, is that gonna be kind of a, a deal breaker? So it's an interesting question. So the Corinthians had written to Paul to discover God's will on these particular issues. This food sacrifice to idols thing was a big deal in the ancient world. Now, there's probably a bit of you that's saying, well, but Chile, in 2022 in Wexford, PA, is the food sacrifice to idol thing still relevant for me today? And I would say, no. Hey, thank you so much for being here. I will, no, there's more. I, I would say this. Literally, that one is probably not gonna be a common one that you and friends uh, deal with you know, in your office on Monday. However... As you see, as we study through this, this is gonna hit closer to home than you could possibly imagine. More about the attitude towards religiosity or cold, calculated rule following and getting so caught up in the rules that we no longer love people well. That the priority becomes more of following the rules and agenda and traditions rather than loving and caring for folks. So it actually will be relevant. The real question here that Paul addresses and pinpoints is the question of freedom, discernment, knowledge, and love. Freedom, discernment, knowledge, and love. Are we supposed to leverage our freedoms in an effort to love? I'll ask it one more time. Orchard Hill Church, are we supposed, as followers of Jesus, are we supposed to leverage the freedoms that we have in an effort to sacrificially love other people and make the most of every opportunity? I would argue an emphatic yes. In fact, when the Lord renovates our hearts and changes our hearts from the inside out, I believe he compels us to go and love sacrificially. Why? Because we know where we are eternally. We have the assurance of salvation. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. When we're sacrificing time, money, efforts, maybe it's a difficult person to navigate relationally. When we're sacrificially loving people, we are giving things we can't keep anyway and leveraging them in an effort to make an impact eternally. So the trade, although it's difficult, don't get me wrong, I push my own agenda to the forefront a lot, very selfish, self-centered, you know, manipulative at times. There's definitely moments where my agenda, I make paramount. So I'm not judging you or, or talking at you, I'm talking with you. But is that the key here? Is that the important part? Is the goal, is love the goal and the chief purpose of greater knowledge? Is the, is the purpose of greater knowledge to love better? It's interesting when we talk about freedom uh, in my life, I've had moments where maybe I've been part of the solution and I've leaned in and used my freedom and leveraged that to sacrificially love others. I've had other moments where I have completely botched the thing and fumbled the ball and used my freedom for my own good and own 
advantages and my own uh, self uh, promotion. It's funny, and as you grow up, I think you understand and learn freedom uh, differently. There's times in my life where I've had a moment where I thought, this is gonna give me real freedom. This is gonna lift all, you know, take the governor off and really lift some of these uh, shackles off of me. And I remember way back in the day, hearken with, with me, if you will, way back in the day when I was in middle school, way back in middle school, crazy time for all of us, um, in middle school, and imagine this, I haven't mentioned this in any of the other services, I wrestled, you ready for this? In, in middle school, I wrestled at 95 pounds. Those days are really, I could have a couple of 95 pound people on me right now, and it would be similar, but 95 pounds, little tiny Mike Chilcote back in middle school, and we had an old school, I lived just north of uh, downtown Columbus, in this, this small suburb just north of the city, and uh, our school was really old, and it had no air conditioning, no central air, and it had no windows, really. I mean, a few windows here and there, but really most rooms were windowless, terrible design. It was like a, a prison barracks, and this were designed by the same people. So we had this you know, situation late in the year when it was getting really, really hot. And I'll be honest, I wanna push pause for a second. I was quite comfortable. I don't even remember being uncomfortable. I thought it was fine. But some people were really upset and thought, this is really hot in here. And they're saying, this isn't right, that we don't have air and there's no windows and it's just it's so stuffy in here. It's terrible. You can't learn like this, right? And we had a class, one of the periods, and it was taught by this old sort of hippie that was like, you take it to the streets, stick it to the man, right? And you guys need to protest. You need to protest the fact you don't have air conditioning. Little 13-year-old Chili was like, this is a brilliant idea to just watch chaos reign and do something stupid. So me and my friend Bob are in the back of the room going, that's right, that's right, we gotta get everybody fired up. And we start saying, no cool, no school. No cool, no school, I agree. And let me tell you, push pause for a second, tell you about my friend Bob. So Bob, I was not very academically rigorous at the time, I didn't take it very seriously. I was like the, the most skilled uh, member of academia who ever lived compared to Bob. He was barely awake in school, right? And Bob, uh, his dad was our baseball coach among other things, but it was weird because as little as Bob took it seriously, his dad was the total opposite. Rick, big intimidating dad. Maybe you had a dad among your friend group that was like that. We were all a little scared of Rick. Menacing guy, a strict disciplinarian. He did not play, okay? Keep that in mind. So Bob's there, we're firing up with, hey, no cool, no school, and uh, we start to walk around the hallways and tell people, hey, listen, we're gonna, we're, you know, no cool, no school. So at, at recess, this is how long ago this was, we had recess, at recess, we're gonna meet on the football field, and we're gonna let them know we don't appreciate this, and we need to get air conditioning or whatever. No cool, no school. So uh, this is also the kind of kid Bob was, we, one time we had a poetry final. We had worked on it all semester, a poetry final. You can tell I was really good in, in the poetry final, but I had actually worked on my poem and everybody's turning in their poems and Bob sees us moving sheets up to the front of the room and he's like, what are you guys doing? We're like, what's the poetry final? It's due today. He's like, poetry final? I'm like, this is the class you're in. This is what we've been working on the whole semester. He, and his eyes get real big, so he rips a piece of paper out of a three ring binder and quickly, if any Curtis Blow fans, if you're an 80s rap fan, this is what he wrote on his poetry final. Basketball is my favorite sport. I like to watch him dribble up and down the court. He turned that in for his poetry final. I will tell you, Bob got an F on that paper, but the effort was there. So this is the kind of student we're talking about. So we're out in the football field, and we think maybe it'll be funny if a few folks come out. It is the majority of the eighth grade class and a lot of the seventh grade class meet us on the field. We have no plan. So we start chanting, no cool, no school. We can't learn like this. You know, and they're taking, you know, clues from Bob who never went to class. So they're yelling, he's no cool, no school. So the principal comes out. It's now become this full on weird thing. And the principal comes out with a bullhorn. He's like, children, children return to class. This is uh, inappropriate, return to class. Everyone's chanting louder and louder, no cool, no school. So like a bunch of immature middle school kids, we don't know how to deal with this situation. So someone yells, run away. So everybody scatters and runs away. This is where the story gets a little crazy. My house was, I lived four doors down from the school. Someone yells, party at Chili's house. So now I have the majority eighth grade class and some of the seventh graders are in my home. My mom is at work. 
People are breaking stuff. I'm like, this is, this is not what, I, I thought it'd be funny. This is getting out of control. And so I'm really nervous and I walk outside and I mean, can you believe it? It's lunch break. Right then my mom's minivan is coming down the street. And my mom runs up and there are people just, aim, it looks like Animal House, right? All going crazy in the front yard. And I run up and I'm like, mom, I wanted to stay in school really badly, and then I was just peer pressured to leave, and all these people came over here, and she's not really buying it, she's a smart lady, but she's like, get everybody out of here. So right when she's like concerned and get everybody out of here, the news channels, local news channels, pull up to the school in our front yard, and they are reporting that these you know, moronic kids have, uh, that look super spoiled have you know, snuck out of school because there's no, no air conditioning, no school, no, or no cool, no school. So my mom is just overwhelmed, so she sends us away. So I leave, I walk down to Bob's house. I'm sitting there with Bob. It's uh, several hours after school now. The whole thing has subsided. And uh, we're sitting there, and Bob's dad comes in early from work, and he's wearing a suit. And Rick comes in, big, tall, menacing Rick, walks in, and we're sitting on the couch, and he goes, Bob, somebody informed me that there was a walkout at the school. You didn't have anything to do with this, did you, Bob? And Bobby's like, no, no, sir, nothing. I was in class, focused. He's like, good, glad to hear it. And Chili, you're not a good influence on him either. You two need to take this stuff seriously. We're like, absolutely, sir, we never left. Right then, it happened to be around five o'clock when the local news was on. <laughs> Smart kids that we were. So Rick, you know, he's had a long day at work. He gets a drink, he sits down, he puts on the news, and there is a shot of a reporter saying, these students uh, you know, walked out today because of lack of air conditioning, which sounds ridiculous. And right then, it shows a clip of the principal with a bullhorn, and Bob is front and center in the face of the principal going, no cool, no school. And Rick's head explodes, and he's like, Chili, go home right now. I was like, yes, sir, and we never saw Bob again. That was the last time we ever saw Bob. I don't know what happened to him, but that is a silly story where I talk about our apparent view of what freedom would look like. We were using it for ourselves. We didn't even have a plan. We had no idea. We were taking it for granted. We were just kind of all over the place and aimless. Freedom can be super confusing. Now, were our motives selfless there? Were our motives looking out for other people or were they about ourselves? Knowledge and freedom aren't enough in and of themselves. Knowledge and freedom aren't enough in and of themselves. Um, 1 Corinthians 8.1, the passage that you heard Dan Irvin read, the first verse says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Did you notice that part? Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. You see, knowledge without love as the goal is hollow at best and deeply narcissistic at worst. Knowledge, just for knowledge's sakes, if there's no action taken, is self-centered, egotistical, and narcissistic. So how can we approach knowledge, freedom, and discernment to help us love more effectively? We need to stop and put a stake in the ground and say, if it's just about head knowledge, if it's just about knowing things, well, we're gonna be arrogant. Think more uh, of ourselves than we ought. But if instead we say and look through the lens of, Lord, you have paid it all on the cross for me. Jesus, you love me. I was fearfully and wonderfully made. Lord, even though I'm a screw up, you forgive me. And in humility, we say, I wanna learn more about you and know you more intimately and allow that love to compel me to go care for others and give away time, talent, treasure that I can't keep anyway, then that will actually lead to humility, not just knowledge. If it stops at knowledge, we're dead in the water. James 1.22 says this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. I love James. He's so straightforward. It's not, it's not a gray area. It's black and white. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. It can't just be head knowledge. It can't just be academia. It needs to be more than that. We have to experience it for ourselves. If we learn about love and we learn everything there is to know about caring for people sacrificially, but never roll our sleeves up and do it, it's dead, it's empty, it's hollow. There's a great movie called Good Will Hunting that came out a long time ago. You've maybe you've seen it. Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, Robin Williams. If you don't know the story, the story is about Will Hunting, played by Matt Damon, and he is a savant. He's a, a brilliant guy who grew up in a tough situation. 
faced a lot of adversity, some abuse, was in and out of foster care, and he has got some anger issues, understandably, right? Well, he's working as a janitor, and at night, he is solving these ridiculous equations that took people months to solve. He's solving them on the chalkboard. He's being covert about it, too, but they find out who it is, and they send him to a series of counselors as he's trying to work through the pain that he uh, endured as a child. And at one point, he's with Robin Williams, and Robin Williams one day takes him out they sit by a lake, and at first, Matt Damon is sort of mocking him, saying, is this a Folgers Crystals moment? What is this? He's sort of you know, belligerent and, and making fun of him. And Robin Williams goes on for the next few minutes to talk about, you, whenever I ask you about love, you might quote me a sonnet. And when I ask you about war, you might quote Shakespeare. When I ask you about this experience of putting yourself out there, you would quote some other reference to a book. And basically, he says, but you've never been in a war. You've never experienced pain and loss. You've never experienced true love because you've never stuck yourself out there and rolled your sleeves up and done it. And it's this amazing scene about the difference between head knowledge and actually experiencing it for yourself and stepping out of your comfort zone. It has to go from your head to your heart and then actions where it will compel and push your feet forward in sacrificial love. You see, head knowledge and study on actively and sacrificially loving others, it's important. We want to do that. But if you never step out and practice and live out that knowledge, it's just dead. So Paul begins his answer pinpointing the key to this passage and the principle to use when answering all questions. He sums it up in the beginning. And here's how he does it. When trying to figure out what to do, so this, this question that comes into him from the church in Corinth, we're concerned about this food sacrifice to idols, Paul's main point and his main theme and thread through the whole thing, don't miss this, is as follows. Consider what is the most loving thing you can do for others. He starts that way and ends that way. Consider what is the most loving thing you can do for others. Do we stop, take a deep breath, and start any moment when we're trying to figure out what to do with that attitude and outlook? What's the most loving thing I can do for others? Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The author Seike Kubo says it this way, knowledge alone leads to pride, to a lack of consideration, and to exploitation. I think that's an important part for us to, to highlight as well. We can twist it and pervert it and, and, and exploit folks in an effort to make it beneficial for ourselves. So is it the knowledge that trips us up? Chili, are you saying that knowledge alone is somehow evil or that's bad? Not at all. Don't mistake this. Is knowledge bad? Is that the stumbling block? No, that's not what I'm saying. Once again, when trying to figure out what to do, consider what is the most loving thing you can do for others. So if we grow in knowledge, will that lead to, will that lead to abounding love? I would argue yes. As we are growing in knowledge and discernment, it will help us love more effectively. Two, knowing biblical truth allows us to bring the power of God's word to bear. The knowledge of knowing God's word will allow us to enact it and utilize it and leverage it. If we just know it and never use it, it's worthless. If we know it and actually practice it, now we're making an internal impact. Hebrews 4.12 talks about the, the, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. That when we're reading this book, this is not some old Charles Dickens novel or something. This is a book that is living and active, God's inspired word. We're getting to experience Jesus when we read it. It's God's playbook for us. <coughs> Excuse me. And when we read this word and live it out, Isaiah 55, 11 will happen, which says the word will not return void. So when I'm actually learning this and then the, putting the head knowledge in and then I'm practicing it, I'm watching an impact happen, not because I'm so great, I'm the opposite of that, but because Christ is so great, his love compels me and impacts the other person in a way that's eternal. Things I can't hold on to anyway, I'm using and leveraging for an eternal purpose. The person who enters into study with awe at the mind-blowing depth and intricacy of God's creation and personal love for all his people will have humility take root in their hearts and in their minds as their knowledge increases. If we approach the throne of God's grace apart from this humility, 
Like I said before, we will think more highly of ourselves than we ought. And we'll end up being egotistical, insecure folks who do things with selfish motives at all times. And that'll be it for us. That'll be our story. Paul continues on, navigating through the waters of increased knowledge and freedom and how they relate to love. Back in 1 Corinthians 8, verses four through six, it says this. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. The gods that the meat was sacrificed, in this particular example, the gods lowercase g, plural, the gods that this meat was sacrificed are fictional. They don't exist. That's what Paul's saying. These aren't even really gods anyway. It's just fake, right? These are little idols. The gods the meat was sacrificed doesn't exist, so eating the meat is not a problem. So let's start with that. He's saying, hey, eating the meat is not a problem. They're not even really gods anyway. Hey, enjoy your freedom that you can eat with a clear conscience, you can eat this meat. Because they're not even really real gods anyway. So they're free to eat the meat because they know better. But it shifts a little bit here in verse seven. Paul says, yeah, that's true, you're free. They're not real gods. But there's some other considerations. Verse seven in chapter eight says this. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Christians who used to worship these false gods may be stumbled. Paul's saying, yeah, it's, they're not real gods. Yeah, it's not a big deal if you eat the meat. You have the freedom, but... Consider leveraging that freedom to choose not to because some of the folks in the room are gonna be stumbled by this. It's gonna bother them. He's saying, you are free to eat the meat, but there are different ways to use your freedom here. Verse nine, it goes on to talk about a weaker conscience. And this is not the only place where Paul references this weaker conscience. He talks about it in Romans 14. In fact, it's more well known in Romans 14 than even 1 Corinthians 8. So why does Paul mention this and why does he consider them weak in faith? It's a little bit weird. If you first started following the Lord and first started reading the Bible, you'd be like, oh, I thought they'd call the weak people the really strict, disciplinarian, religiously pious rule followers. But that's not what he says. Paul calls the weak those folks who are kind of focused in on the rules and says, those of you who are a little more enlightened that this is not the major thing, that they're kind of majoring in the minors here, He's like, you're, you're, you're the more enlightened crowd, but let's not make them stumble. Let's be sacrificial in how we love people. So here it is, in, in summary, Paul's main concern, not making either side change their actions, but avoiding division and judgment. Individual freedoms differ from one person to another. Hey, spoiler alert, any history buffs in the room? The church has had a little trouble over the years with some division. No, really. I mean, it's been a problem. Unity needs to be something that we lean into, and here's where Paul is getting, he's talking about it, he's dealing with it. There are matters of conscience which amount to individual moral imperatives. Let me explain what I mean. There are gonna be some things that are clearly God's will or against God's will. I love it in scripture when it starts with, it is God's will if, because then I'm like, okay, I can relax. This is black and white, I know this one. I can build a foundation on it. There's some moral gray area that we'll get into in a second, but there's some black and white ones. Those would include, thou shall not kill, thou shall not lie, uh, thou shall have no other gods before me. These are ones that, you know, there's no confusion here what he means by these. Actually, really quickly, this has nothing to do with anything. I was at a conference, a Christian conference, a leadership conference a while back, and there was this woman that got up, she was a really good speaker, but at one moment, she had a funny moment where she said, you know, we all struggle with different sins. Some of them, I, I struggle with the same sins every day, and... Some of these sins you're, you're, you're struggling with every week. And we're like, yes, yes. And she's like, you know, you might lie. And we're all like, mm-hmm, yep. You know, you might not honor your father and mother. I'm like, oh, certainly, yeah, that's true. 
She's like, maybe you, you, know, you murder people or maybe you uh, cheat. And we were like, wait, can you go back one? Murder people? She's like, yeah, every day. No, so we left the conference. We were scared and frightened of her. No, maybe she meant hating your, your, your brother or sister, but she said murder. Anyway, I move on. Here's another one. Don't get drunk. I'm gonna stop for a second. I'm gonna use drinking as an example, not because it's the most important one, but because I think we can relate to it, okay? Don't get drunk. So the morally gray area of that one would be this. Having a drink is not usually sinful. Having a drink is not usually sinful. Going to a bar is usually not sinful, right? However, what if you're an alcoholic to whom one drink can cause you to spiral out of control? If you even go to a bar, you'll lose it. What if that's you? This may be a sin for you, but not for others. Do you see that? Where there's no absolute there? For that person, that might be a sin because it causes so much pain and heartache and they know themselves and they've been there. For others, it might not be a problem. I'll have a drink. I might go out with friends or neighbors and have a drink socially. I mean, I will. And I will go out and have a drink or two with friends or family with a clear conscience. I'll go out and have a drink with a clear conscience. However, I myself have been in situations in my life where maybe I know that this friend of mine went through rehab. Or maybe I'm with someone who I know, hey, they had an abusive alcoholic parent and it's painful for them. Or maybe it's just someone who I know, culturally, they grew up in a situation where consuming alcohol wasn't a thing that was done and this will be a stumbling block for them. So I, I will have moments where I literally will say, I'm gonna bypass drinking in this particular circumstance because it'll trip them up. Easy way to, and it's a silly example, but it's an easy way to sacrificially love and consider the other person. Take my freedom that I have, those things are not inherently sinful, and leverage them and sacrifice that freedom for the betterment of the other person. In the book Messy Spirituality, one of my favorite books by a guy named Michael Iaconelli, a fantastic book, he tells the story of John Mackey. I wanna read it to you now. The story goes like this. John Mackey was the president of the Church of Scotland after World War II. With two other ministers from a rather severe and pietistic denomination, he traveled to some remote parts of the Balkan Peninsula to check on missionaries they supported in rural parts of the country. The three clergymen called on an Orthodox priest in a small Greek village. Excited to see the visitors, the priest offered the clergyman a glass of rare and expensive wine. Horrified, the two pietistic ministers refused. Dr. Mackey, on the other hand, took a glass full, sniffed it like a wine connoisseur, and sipped it and praised its quality. He even asked for another glass. His companions were noticeably upset by Dr. Mackey's behavior. Later, when the three men were in the Jeep again and making their way up the rough road to the village, the two pious clergymen turned on Dr. Mackey with a vengeance. Dr. Mackey, they insisted, do you mean to tell us that you are the president of the Church of Scotland and an officer of the World Council of Churches and you drink? Dr. Mackey had had all he could take and his Scottish temper got the better of him. No, I'm not a drinker, but I thought someone should be a Christian. My hunch is that Dr. Mackey didn't convince his condemners the rules of their faith were much more important than showing grace. They were much more excited about condemning the faith of Dr. Mackey and the priest than they were about living their own faith. Chapter eight ends like this. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you with all their knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't they be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. Being a Christian is about freedom, not restriction. There might not be a bigger misconception in Christianity in the entire thing than that. Being a Christian is about freedom, not restriction. John 8, 31 through 32, really famous verses here in the Gospels. John 8, 31 and 32 reads this way. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and catch this, and the truth will set you free. The truth will set us free, and then the Lord says, yeah, now leverage that freedom, sacrificially give it up for the betterment of other people. 
Consider how you would love them properly and in the best way. So here it is, I'm gonna close with this in summary. The principle of servant love suggests self-denial without judgment. Self-denial without judgment. We should enjoy our freedom, enjoy it. This is hard enough to follow Christ without making up rules. So enjoy our freedom. Two, what we do in the gray areas can differ from one situation to the next. Keep that in mind. We should accept differences without judgment. Four, avoid pushing the gray area matters into the absolute category. We see that too. Here's some potential pitfalls of not avoiding this. If you don't avoid this, here's some potential pitfalls. They would include fear of contamination by the world leads to withdrawal. I've seen so many Christians where they're so afraid of being contaminated by the world that they withdraw and become a little hermit and they're ineffective at best. At worst, they come across as really arrogant, self-righteous. Two, Christians lose touch with their non-Christian friends. Who did Jesus hang out with? Sinners, the world, everybody, his neighbors. Christians become detestable to the non-Christian world. And finally, it draws attention away from what really matters. It majors in the minors. If you're thinking I'm being way too liberal on this, let me bring it back a little bit. Potential pitfalls of unrestricted freedom. There's also those. Those include people will misunderstand our actions if we have unrestricted freedoms and just say whatever. People will conclude that right and wrong does not matter. That's not where we're going either. And finally, we'll lose our freedoms due to excess. I've seen it happen. Finally, in conclusion, living for Christ gives us true freedom. Two, don't use your freedom as a way to satisfy your selfish desires, yours and mine. Three, rather use your freedom. What would it look like, Orchard Hill Church, if we used our freedom to serve in love? If we truly leverage the freedoms that we have with the wonderful attitude of, I'm gonna fix my eyes on the eternal, not the temporary, and I'm gonna leverage these to serve in love. And finally, we need to resist any attempts to go beyond what God has revealed in his written word. We don't need to add more stuff to restrict us. When trying to figure out what to do, consider what is the most loving thing you can do for others. I'm gonna pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity this morning. I pray that we leave here knowing you better than when we walked in. And Lord, I pray that we lean into this. What does it look like to leverage our freedoms to sacrificially love others? We thank you for giving us your word and giving us your truth. In your name we pray, amen. Thanks for being here, Go Pens! See you soon.